paradise. Hey, me Dundee United. The sun is hot, the colour is tangerine, and the chat in the stands is Dundee Scots. I'm here to blether with Gary Robertson, singer, scaffy, playwright and poet. This is me like it. See, sat in the Dundee sun, watching United skelp the Fifers. Eh. Can I beat it? It's no drich, it's no drab, it's no druka. We're sitting in the blazing sunshine. This is the game. Pure <laughs> tackle. <laughs> Folk hey cried Dundonian ore. That's the Scots word for common. Gary's new reclaiming both the word and the language. It's the same in any city. We share familiar stories. This is just our wee but street culture. Dealt in language, we can't ore. Scheme life, it's the only life we've kent. Scheme life, sometimes never pride the rest. Jake is more likely the folk around here than a can they speak Scots. Yeah, I, th I think you just speak the way you naturally have always spoke in. And it's about having the confidence in, in yourselves, in your culture. And be comfortable with it. Speak, speak uh, normal. Because oh. it is a part of your national identity as well, isn't oh, it? Oh, definitely. They go hand in hand. I mean, wherever you come from in Scotland, have I got dialects and that? But I threw it. The Scots language is, is in amongst it. I mean, it's like people say talk proper. I mean, what is proper? Proper to me is speaking the way I do on the streets, and and the same for Abdi in, in this country. Anybody that speaks that pure, posh, fake accent, that's, that's just made up. <laughs> I think you're right. It's pure mint. Now, I consider Scots to be a language. I consider you to be bilingual. Would you consider yourself to be bilingual? Oh, I vote. Well, like I say, as an adult and becoming aware of the way I speak, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely say it's bilingual. I mean, I speak Dundonian first and foremost. We Scots and amongst that, so right. that's the way I speak. If, if anybody asks me to speak English, then I'll slow my own first language doing a bit, so I'm audible to, to people that's no fair, Scotland right. in general. I'm Alistair Heather. I'm a Scots writer for Angus. Scots has been the language of our greatest literature, but it's had to throw decades of opposition and neglect. Like my granny and grand, I would, got, would I got a belt if it's spoken in Scots. Didn't I speak like that, because I might laugh at you. But no, I hear a sense of Scots speakers all over the country reasserting themselves. We'll heed sooth to hear the braid border Scots a hoik. Let's move order, Maku, get order. West to the urban pattern of Glasgow. It's weird how you can tell who it was that farted just by the tone and all that. And north to the fits and fars in North East Doric. Fin Freen meets Freen. Fit like a day. Our rebel tongue is hen a grassroots renaissance all over the lowlands. But I didn't think the Scotland's high hegians have any idea it's happening. We're doing the fit of the Royal Mile. This is the outer wall of Holyrood Parliament. And the first thing you see when you come down here is fragments of Scots poetry. Burns here. Or would some poor the gifted gee us to see ourselves as others see us? Or here the, the working class trade unionist feminist Fay Dundee, Mary Brooksbank. Oh dear me, the world's ill divided. Them that work the hardest are I we least provide it. And there's mayor. This is another thing that I really like. It's Fair Walter Scott book. When we had a king and a chancellor and a parliament or reign, we could I pebble them with stains when they were in the gidbeams, but nave his nails can reach the length of London. So there you hear Scott's prose, Scott's poetry hammered into the fabric of this building. Good strong words. Scots poetry on the Scots Parliament, natural. But getting inside and that powerful language disappears. There's no end to the multilingual information available. 
as long as you aren't looking for it in Scots. On peut lire l'histoire du Parlement écossais en français, but you can't read any of these in Scots. When you come into the Parliament, you hear these pamphlets in Spanish and Gaelic and English and English and English, but they didn't hear a Scots version. It might sound a bit pernickety, but the question is, if the language is good enough to decorate the outside, how come it isn't good enough to inform you on the inside? Is there for honest poverty that hangs A while back in 1999, the Scots Parliament opened to a Scots sang by Burns, sung by Sheena Wellington. We dar be pair for all that, for all that, and all Now and again, some MSPs had taken their oath in Scots. And bear our full profile allegiance. I, Kevin Morris Stewart, depone at I will be leal and bear a full allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. But outside of token gestures, nothing really has been done. Before Holyrood opened, there was real hope in some quarters that a Scottish Parliament would help incubate the Scots language. But after 20 years of devolution, you could just about dry your hands on the warm words about Scots to come out of this place. But there's been no real action. We've seen with the Gaelic Language Act that Holyrood can help protect and safeguard our indigenous languages in the 21st century. So we hate to ask, if it's good enough for Gaelic, how is it no good enough for Scots? We can, for the 2011 census, that 1.5 million folk in Scotland speak Scots, making it the UK's biggest minority language. But it's a language that isn't the eye understood. Ignorance around Scots has seen folk tack their own tongue to be slang or bad English and even stap their bairns for speaking it instead of celebrating it as an ancient tongue with a great literature that's right at the heart of our culture. I want to introduce you to the fascinating history of Scots, to the institutional failings of broadcasters, politicians and educators that led to its decline, and show you the grassroots renaissance that's happening with the language right the new all across Scotland. I think we need to tackle new confidence with Scots, tackle it to new spaces and new media. And if I'm preaching that folks should tack their Scots out the house, then I'll hit a day that myself. Truth be told, I'd probably be more comfortable doing this in English, because that's what I'm used to hearing. But I'm not going to do that, because I think we hate to get used to hearing different Scots dialects on the telly. There's folk about that say that Scots is an odd language nobody kens on the To test that out, we went to a bonny West Lothian tune for an unscientific survey. So we're out the day in Lithgay, or Linlithgow, to see how many folk ken the Scots lead or language. We hear 10 Scots words and we're going to test their knowledge. Ken, do you know? Get ears. Get ears. Druth. Never heard of that. Never? No. Uh, dry mouth, isn't it? Well, we've got Thirsty. the pub to sort the druth out and have a pint. Exactly that. Macker. I have heard that before. Mm -hmm. uh, something his nosy. The sea and the sand comes up and it's the... That's macker in the Gaelic. It is. Poet. Aye, so you hear national oh, knackers now. I know, but it's lovely. Bra. Oh, that's what I am. <laughs> Good. Exactly, perfect. That's poison. Aye. Mouth. Shut your puss. Shut your puss. Oh. Tell you what, you're Boom. good, by the way. Boom. <laughs> She's good, mate. Bringe. I'm actually shocked to myself I'm there. How did any of these? Bringe. So it's a verb, to bringe. You'd hear in football commentary, maybe? Football? Aye. I'm not heard that, I'm football daft. Aye, that's to make a. Mr. Russian, a bringe and a something. Boom. Right. <laughs> Pull it. No idea. No. This sounds rude. If I'm arguing with Alassie, I'll say, shut it, you hoolet. Shut it, you hoolet. That is exactly what you say. It's a hair? It's not a goose. 
funny enough, when I was arguing with that last year about the cars and all that, I called her a hoolet. <laughs> I know, all. Oh! <laughs> We're still in the hoolet! <laughs> but around the low the ends and bits of fife, it can be used because it's nocturnal kind of elements. It can be used to refer to prostitutes or loose women. Do. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Where are we taking these for the Highlands? <laughs> so it's us. It comes through, it comes through the middle Dutch. Has it? You're doubt. Lead. It's all your song. To lead you? No, to take you somewhere? No. Lead? Um, maybe like your dense or something like you got a heat lip lead. <laughs> no, uh, the old Scots word for language. Oh. So the national lead. Oh. As a way of referring to Scots. Mm -hmm. But off the obscure. Cool. Absolute pleasure. That was great speaking to you. Cheers. 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 I was fair impressed with the levels of understanding by older folk in particular. But when you put all these words together, do you end up with a language? I think I. But no Abdi will take my word for it. So we'd best ask somebody that kens. Ah, uh, yes. And if you ask a linguist what is a language, it's one of the trickiest questions. How do you define it? So some folk might say, well, there, a language has to be mutually incomprehensible. One person speaking one language when I understand another person speaking another language. But that ends blown out of the water if you go to somewhere like the Scandinavian countries. You've got three separate languages there, Norwegian, Danish and Swedish, mm -hmm. and yet they're mutually comprehensible. Now, there's the other side of that where if you name something as a language, it's a language. And certainly, again, in the Scandinavian case, they used to not be named separate languages. And then there was a political act that changed that. And then they became those three separate languages. So linguistically, there is no definition that works mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. But for political reasons or borders reasons, we've really got these artificial borders rune languages, right? So linguistically very hard to define, but you can then name it as a language and it becomes that. If it's good enough for Norway, it's mere than good enough for me. Any of the reasons Scots is a language is its lang history. Right back for the 1300s onwards, folk had been writing in Scots, including monarchs like Jamie the Sixth, who was a keen macker, or poet. I've been that thrilled to come down here. If there's one thing I love, it's a story old book. Uh, tell us about. They're not story. <laughs> so tell us about what you've set out for us. Right, what we've set out is in particular mm -hmm. is the Basilic Condoron. It's Greek for royal gift, mm -hmm. gift of a king. Mm -hmm. It was basically a long letter to James's oldest son, Henry, mm -hmm. who was the Duke of Rothsey. Mm -hmm. And it comes in three parts. It says how to be a good Christian, how to be a good king, and how to stay a good king and fun, okay. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. No, so big Jamie the Sixth, mm -hmm. he spoke Scots. Yes. Is his book in Scots? Yes, it's in Scots. Uh, it was his mother tongue, mm -hmm. so it came natural to him. Is it what we'd recognise as Scots today? No, it's an earlier form. We would call it Middle Scots. Mm -hmm. In the 1500s, Scots wasn't they just the leader of kings, of course. It was the tongue of the common folk, and ah. What's really interesting is we book I found here. It's the only surviving copy of Scotland's first printed medical text. It's basically a sort of public health pamphlet on how to stop spread of the plague. If you wanted to communicate with the ordinary folk around Scotland, you had to be doing it in Scots. And the Scots used here is way more recognisable as Scots. It's way more the common tongue of the folk. So there's a great wee quote I'd like to read for you. There is more notice whilk shaws in man infected be pest. First, get the exterior pertus of the body be called, and the interior pertus of the body be vermin het. Also, a great delure of the heed, a great druth, and last of all, but most certain, under the oxters or by the secret members, appears a posthumous called bubonis. So you hear a lot of words in there that folk would think of as just being part of a Scottish accent rather than being part of a Scots language. So words like heed, words like called, words like het, 
Hate isn't a mispronunciation of the English hot, it's just the Scots word het, and it's exactly the same as the modern Swedish word for hot. Scots was in its pomp under Jamie Sixth, in a real day in the sun. In the 1500s, Scots was the lead in the street, in the field, in the mackers and sangsters, in the law courts and in medicine. And with the Stuart King's reign in Edinburgh, it was a regal tongue and all. But in 1603, Scots took a sair dunk. King Jamie scuttled off down the road to London to become King James I of England. With that, Scots tint its regal macker and chief artistic sponsor, a scunner. That sent her a poor and prestige for the lead gave way him. And it was in danger then of becoming a folk lead mm. and a lead of uh, regions and uh, variations rather than him a prestigious centre for the lead. There's a lovely <coughs> song that I quote for the borders that goes, the king is o'er the border gain, in London for to dwell, and friends we mun we England be, since he buys there himself, and will go no more a roving. The kind of lamenting the fact that uh, we Jamie a war would have to concentrate ourselves on, on our own resources and be friendly with England. Well, that friendship with England that's fine, but it shouldn't have extended to trying to eradicate uh, aspects of Scottish culture. And <clears throat> an important thing that happened was that with the first the aristocrats head in sooth, where the poor was, they began to change their language, trying to adapt to English norms. And eventually the middle classes and the merchant classes would try and do the same, but they didn't succeed. And I would maintain that it was probably no until the media of the 20th century that folk began to be able to switch uh, to English comfortably and learn who English is spoken. This is London. Here is the news. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. As Billy says, you can't overestimate the negative impact on Scots of hearing RP English voices broadcast into every home. In this, the BBC and the Scotsman, who was its first general manager, had a lot to answer for. Enter John, later Lord, Reith. Here in the middle of the Scottish headquarters of the BBC is Lord Reith's desk. It was while he was working for the BBC doing in London that Lord Reith made the decision to start pumping received pronunciation English into every wireless in Scotland. That had a massive impact on the way that Scots folk like me and you would think about our language. A year before he did, Reith was interviewed and betrayed his own cringe at hearing even the gentlest of Scotch voices. Uh, do I speak very definitely Scotch? Oh, very. What I tried to get was a style or quality of English which would not be laughed at in any part of the country. Of course, there has been plenty of Scots broadcast on the BBC now and again. You see things like uh, chewing the fat. Is that you? Oh, absolutely, that's us. Is that what you start wanting? Indeed, that is all we're wanting. Right, that's one chicken supper, one single special fish, three pickles, two sachets of red sauce, 16 pound eighty. There you are, my delightful wee bockle. Keep the change. What about our suppers? Oh, hang the suppers. We're paying for the banter. <laughs> but you still didn't see it used as a language of status. You still didn't see it being used as a language for serious stuff. Radio Scotland News. New the news in Scots. English listeners, man retune to VHF. A House of Commons committee for home affairs has again wailed drugs as the may dug some fay the young of the... Don't worry, this footage hasn't quantum leap here for a better Scotland. This isn't an actual Scots language bulletin. It was paired in an old Scots documentary. It was presented by Billy Kay in the 1980s. 
in a typical old news reel, a pucker... So Billy, i got a few wee clips lined up for your Mother Tongue series for the 80s, because there's stuff that you've got that we Excuse me, the Mother Tongue. The BBC did not want it to be called the Mother Tongue. It was called the Mother Tongue. Ah, oh, didn't they care that? <laughs> Anybody from Canada? Whatever they cried it, it was a smashing film. There's a bitty that really makes clear the distinctions between Scots and English. The border still divides two quite distinctive linguistic communities. On the north, the Bairns of Cold Stream, and in the south, just about half a mile away, the children of Cornhill and Tweed. What do you call the big animals that say moo? Cows. Coos. What's the vegetable that, when you cut it up, it makes you cry? An onion. A greeter or a inging. Is that your scratching just now? Head. A head. What do you call things Sweeties comes in? Blag. Pork. Blag, man. Hi. That's me, face. <laughs> I'm old pizza. <laughs> Delighted. <laughs> Folk love that. Some folk hated it because it showed the difference between Scotland and England. The fact that there was such a difference linguistically, a few miles for each other. You can joke about it now, but I was accused of being racist because I didn't give the English wains a sweetie. And I just gave it. <laughs> in the end of the day, you'll have to cut something off that side of it to get it to, get it to wedge in as well. The film also showed Scots in a fankel with a class system. To, to, to get the hecht right. Get what? The hecht the right. The hecht right, right. See that side here? Yeah. See where it's handy? Keep. Why don't you cut off the round bit of that log? Oh, whoa, whoa. Look, look, Wallace. Right, right, right. This bit. Why don't, if you cut off this round bit here, then the whole thing will fit in, won't it? What were the BBC making here? They can't. They were getting a great response in the press and in the word of mouth. And they'd be patting themselves in the heed for doing something on a major Scottish subject that had hardly ever been touched before. But eventually, it regressed to what I had been, which is, it's fine as an occasional wee holiday for reality, but we are the British Broadcasting Corporation. And although we've got a remit, although our charter says that we have to reflect the culture of Scotland, well, in Urine, the culture of Scotland is an Anglo-centric Scottish culture, and it's not an ethnic Scottish culture. And ethnic Scottish culture can be a wee bit dangerous because of the politics. BBC Radio Scotland. The BBC has a tremendous capacity for positive impact on Scotland's minority languages. We've already seen that a bit with Gaelic. Back in the early 1900s, Scottish Gaelic was on its arse. It wasn't widely recognised as a language, but just some corrupt dialect of old Irish. And most of the speakers for the different areas didn't realise that they were speaking dialects of a shared language. But when the BBC started broadcasting in radio and in Gael, they different dialect regions started to recognise themselves as being part of a shared language. It wasn't the Irish, it was Scots Gaelic. And that emergent solidarity gied Gaelic speakers the smedum required to be the organised language movement they are the day. Fisker Magaev, Chai na Milchen Kuch, Ka Kogal Trochila, Agus Tulchen and the Parchen Yundui. Scots is miles behind Gaelic. So I got a few pals together for a pint to see how they feel the lead is getting on and if they'd like to see the news in Scots. I'm going to be honest and say that I, I probably would take a file to get used to it, and that's all the mere reason to do it. Aye. In newer days, we're such a media-driven society. If we're Nehe and Doric up there, reading the news or Guinness programmes, more than just Ibote Zuta Peter Heed or The Mart, which are fantastic, by the way, but that's near enough. Aye. So, yourself, like, when you were growing up, like, as a bairn in Aberdeen, when could you speak Scots and when did you hate to speak English? And what was the, what was the kind of support like in the house? My experience of Scots is very much shaped by my mum's because I think she had quite a negative experience of using her mother tongue. So I learnt quite young that didn't speak like that when you're, like, at work or at school or, or in polite company. 
because they won't know what you're saying and they might laugh at you, and, which is really sad. Do you reckon the Bairns are still bringing the Doric with them for the house to the school, or are things changing now? I think my granny and grand I would, got, would I got a belt if they'd spoken the Doric and the squeal. Even my feather and mother, probably. Uh, and in some schools yet, they would, would be frowned upon a wee bit, although that is changing, thankfully. I think it depends what class you are. I think it's sort of middle class, upper class folk, when I speak Doric, mm -hmm. but working class kids do, because they hear it at home and they'll take it into the playground and there's like you know, like for maybe for Tory, for example, our second generation Polish kids speaking Doric because they're hearing it in the playground, you know. When I was living outside of Scotland, there was a couple of words that I thought was really funny that nobody knew them and I had to, like, you know, I think I was moderating already, but I hadn't thought about these two words as being an issue. One was we, which I, I can't really get away from, and I think that, that would have really broad use throughout yeah. Scotland, little. And the other one was tatties. Like, I, tatties? Because like, I, I would be really suspicious any Scottish person that said potatoes. <laughs> <laughs>She also likes our bunny wee rabbit. He's right bunny like. <laughs> Could you guess just a wee bit yourself? She bites up burn fit. Mariana's her name. She's been my pal since P1. <laughs> perfect, absolutely perfect. Is, is Marianne real or is she, are you macking her up for the sake of this exercise? She's next door. Oh. My friend's called Harry. Me and him have been friends for ages, but are slowly coming apart. It's a right shame because we've been uh, it's been 11 years of argues and sleepovers, but we've still we've still made it. <laughs> My friend is a laddie and he likes to draw. I can speak to him online and we blather on and on. The end day I had a sleepover at his and it was well fun. Oh no! <laughs> a friendly, encouraging environment where bairns can use their mother tongue. But this isn't the norm and it was officially opposed for decades. Scots was brought out rarely, for special. It was fine to do a wee bit burns in Scots in January, but I'm poor and folk to use their own tongue the year round. Nay, danger. Now, this is an awfully important bit of text. It's for His Majesty's Inspectorate for Schools, a report for 1947, and it's talking about Scots. It tells us so much about the attitudes to the language. So it says, uh, Scots is not the language of educated people anywhere and could not be described as a suitable medium of education or culture. It is the first duty of infant teachers and the continuing duty of all primary teachers to implant and cultivate fluent speech in standard English. And to, wait, wait and you hear this, against such unlovely forms of speech masquerading as Scots, we recommend that the schools should wage a planned and unrelenting campaign. That's the attitude 
of His Majesty's Inspectorate for Education in 1947. Things are changing. Some schools are at lying last day in mayor than an annual recital a Tea Moose. Hoyk school librarian Tam Clark has overset, that's Scots for translate, the diary of a wimpy kid into the diary of a wimpy Wayne. She's not right if she thinks I'm going to be writing about my feelings or any of that. So if you're waiting and making it, oh, dear diary this and dear diary that, you can have one then. It does seem dead accessible and really good fun. I, I, it is, it is. We're not writing in 16th century Scots. We're not writing in Scots that Bairns are going to struggle with. But we're trying, first and foremost, to make sure that Bairns engage with the books. If you're a, a Bairn for a minority and you didn't see yourself represented on telly or in the news or in literature of the day, then that is going to have a real effect on your self-esteem. Scots speakers are a minority and they're a gradually dwindling minority if we didn't say something about it. This makes a muckle difference to your Bairns and to all Bairns. Scots in the classroom, Scots stories, both are absolutely vital. Right, turn over, off you go. Just go running, just play with that, yeah. But a lead also just needs space where adults can speak it. In Hoyk, a such space is doing at the famous rugby club. We're on Nathan Murray, stop moaning. What you hear here in Hoyk is these gatherings of dozens and dozens of local folk, most nights of the week, just getting together, screaming in each other's lungs. What it, Marty? And just using their language. Goodbye, Bailey. Touch there, get on side, Rudy McLeod. Nathan, stop dropping the bar. <laughs> what, Adam? Do you think language plays a big part? in the sense of community about the place, just Ken and somebody's... Well, aye, oh, for, he speaks like it. He aye, speaks like aye, aye, For us it does, he's Ken. As soon as he, obviously, first couple of words that you're speaking to, if you're going in somebody's house for, to work, he can through the day as your job, he can straight away, or... He, as I say, everybody, more or less, sort of, Ken's everybody, or can somebody connected to... to Ken, wherever you're going, in the, whether it's a rugby team or or working in folks' houses or and stuff like that, so... Because, <laughs> like, your job's all about communication. It's all about communicating ideas. Aye. Do you hate bother with folk from outside Hoyt that come down to play for the club? Because it's not aye, a lot of Hoyt. Aye. aye, you do, uh, quite even folk from, uh, like, say, Edinburgh or, or Glasgow or something like that, you need to uh, watch sort of how you're putting across <laughs> certain words and uh, sentences and stuff like that, but... I mean, as I say, the majority of 80, 90 per cent are, are Hoyt folk, so it's, it's, uh, you were just brought up with that, so it's no, it's no different until you've gone further afield. Scots and Hoyt is fighting to adapt for the 21st century. Another big heartland for the tongue is the North East, where the dialect, Wiles Kent as Doric, is spoken by more than half the population. Traditionally associated with fishing and fermin, it is also a vital modern tool for politicians to relate to their constituents. For a few years now, you've been representing the North East in Holyrood. Yes, indeed. How does your Doric voice help you engage with your, can your voters? Well, I, uh, if I'm up in the North East here and speaking to the fishermen here, if you're speaking to farmers in a meeting in, 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 in Buchan, it's absolutely right and proper to speak to Doric, and I do, I do that all the time. I think the, the, you know, folk here want to be represented by folk that understand what the North East is about, and if you can speak to Doric, then you're halfway there, I would say. What would you think politics could do to encourage, Ken, just to encourage an environment where Berns feel more comfortable using it and learning? Well, it, you, you, you had it in the, the nail in the head. It's about Berns feeling comfortable using it. And if we can get, get that in, 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 ingrained in schools all the way up through primary one, all the way through, and, and let folk uh, celebrate their language, uh, realise that it's important, and realise it's part of the heritage and the culture and the folk, it's part of what we are in the northeast or wherever you are, Faye. It's part of your culture and your heritage. And, and, and make folk proud to be able to speak it like I am. Peter isn't exaggerating about the centrality of Doric Scots to life in the North East. Just lug into the clash at Thainston Mart for 
في بي بي سي سيريز سكوت ان ذا نورث ايست از بيث ا فورمال ليد او بزنس اند بوليتكس اند ار ارتستيكين يوزد ان سم اوف ذا فاينست سانجز اند بويتري ان سكوتلاند سم اوف ويتش بيترز ريكورد ات هيمسيلف One of the poems that's in there is called Pan Loaf. Now, I, when everybody can understand Doric, will understand it. If you're speaking Pan Loaf, you're trying to speak Bosch. There are among us those who fain would treat with scorn and great disdain, and gain the slightest chance would hain the Doric phrase. To hear them speak, you'd think that they were born 500 miles away, instead of between Burnhaven Bay and Yugi's Braes. They think it impolite to say, when freen meets freen. But like a day, oh no, that's not the proper way. It's how do you do? It phrases sick as ours they scoff, they toss their heads and spick pan loaf. They then a host, oh no, they cough. Their bleed is blue. But drop a hammer on their feet or stick a needle in their seat, you'll get the Doric pure and sweet, I rich and rare. If they were rich, they'd need no shock. The garden speak like Buchan folk, there wouldn't be the laughing stock that knew they are. You kind of get away from the fact that that's a Tory MSP who has not only a proud speaker of the language, but a great promoter of it. He's probably the most prominent Scots speaker in Holyrood. It shows that Scots language isn't a nationalist issue, it is a national issue. Flit wherever you like in the North East, and you'll hear the local dialect of Doric Scots. I'm heading up 50 mile to the fish tune of Bucky. One of the interesting things about Bucky, and one of the reasons we are going there, is that in the 2011 census, about 60% of the folk biding in Bucky said that they hay Scots language skills. That's a higher proportion of the population of Bucky hay Scots language skills than you hay folk in Stornoway hay Gaelic skills. When I tell folk I was doing a film about language in Bucky, Abdi said there's a group of folk I just had to meet. Near Rushdish. Nine thirty. No, so we could maybe even take some books there, you know. Oh, definitely. There are burich, a hardcore language activists, who are cry themselves the Bucky Blethers. Hello, Abdi. Hiya. <laughs> Is that free there, eh? Smashing cheers. Hiya. It's nice to see. How's that then? <laughs> uh, so what are we working on today? Well, we're working on our Bucky Blathers Doric Dictionary. Aye, right, seize a copy. Lovely, Just lovely, right. lovely. Off the press, the Scotch, right? Putting together a dictionary here isn't it easy. Just about every clachan on the coast has some of the rain words. Now, a seagull in Bucky is a gow. A gow? Aye. Is that right? But in Fendochte, it's a... No, it's a puli. A puli? A puli. Again, it's a gow in Bucky. What are the Bucky Blethers? Well, several years ago, uh, there was an initiative in our local library here and folk were invited if they had a love for the Doric or an interest to come along. And the place was absolute, packed out the door. So a few of us thought, this can't just be a one-off, we'll need to sustain this. And so we started the Bucky Blethers group and we had like, a lot of fun. Aye, I bet you did. Aye, we did. And we learned a lot, even though we're our Doric speakers, because you have the fishing Doric and you have the fairman Doric mm -hmm. and kind of different bits and pieces for different villages as well. And in the Burahi that get together, aye. there's different there's folk for fairmen and fishing and Aye, there's aye, there's some for, for other communities who never boot. In the Blethers, Evelyn, tell me that working in a bucky shop, she I had to mind her language. So Doric was fine at work, aye. so long as we as we the right people. Yes. You, uh, if your customer was speaking properly, you spoke properly. If it was a bucky customer, you just spoke bucky. Did you ever fall down through it, as it were? Well, many a time I fell down through it. <laughs> it's saying the wrong thing. Oh, I was showing a lady the shoes, and she was <coughs> very well dressed and posh looking. And I walked a pair of nice leather walking shoes. Oh, yes, I'll set. So I was speaking as nice as I can't hotel. 
zo'n schone schoes met krulte van noos, ik ken nee, niet wat dat. Nee, nou, somebody cries, Evelyn. Zo, so, of course, I look at Roon. Took a shoe the box and handed it. So she took it. Now, here she was saying, oh dear, the laces, they're all done up. Oh, I said, I'm so sorry, but that easily allows your pants. <laughs> <laughs> so you're getting at the posh accent. Oh, I, they're, they're quite so, near laughing, you see, but I couldn't have laughed as well, I was seeing in the way. But she never turned her hair. <laughs> she just gave it on. Have you ever um, seen uh, kind of Doric being published in kind of paper around here or anything like that? Oh, no, occasionally a wee bit in the Bucky Squeaker, the Bucky Advertiser. Uh -huh. <laughs> the Bucky Squeaker. <laughs> Even in the TV, there's only one Scottish programme. You can look with Scottish music, Scottish singing, Scottish speaking, like what there used to be long mm. ago. Honestly, it's been sick a pleasure coming here and meeting you selling the blethers. <laughs> well, thank you, my lord. Can I get a wee boozy? <laughs> oh, good, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a pleasure. <laughs> that was just a pleasure. Evelyn would love to hear Mayor Scott on the telly and on the radio. But previous attempts to put the lead on the screen sailed the BBC into choppy water. It was poor off and it started to freshen last night. Like, I don't think you would expect what we're going to do off the day like this. I keep working to do it. I get funny news for the what's not or anything, but. In 2006, Trollerman subtitled an oar set into English, The Fisherman. Presuming that nobody could understand the Scots of the Arcadian, Doric and Chetlandic men. Ah, what are you doing, boys? You're going to be here. We're going to kennel. We're going to come here tea before we finish. Come over then. The white horse will do, you'll get wet. One of the great things that Scottish folk get raging about is when perfectly normal Scottish folk get put on the English telly and get put subtitles on. Well, that's an interesting one, and I think a lot of that is the psychology of it. We hear something different and we think, I can't understand it, I can't understand it, I can't understand it. And of course, we do it within Scotland as well. Mm -hmm. Folk from Glasgow will go up to the North East and say, can he understand them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Folk from the North East will come down to Glasgow, can't understand what they're saying here, right? My dad, that's a quote from my dad, he <laughs> says it multiple times. So there's some psychology goes on when we think we can't understand, but is that really the case, right? And also it's to do with exposure. So if you go back 30 years ago, somebody here in Geordie would say, can't understand it really distinct dialect there. Now, everybody understands Cheryl Cole. Well, not everyone thinks them are shit. A lot of my friends go on them when we go to town fair, I swear okay. to God. And that's through exposure. We hear it a lot more. Mm. You, come, you become tuned into it. You begin to understand it. So in terms of uh, the different dialects, as you've said, like Edinburgh Scots went one way, Dundee Scots, blah, blah, blah. Um, what do we share? So, Lots of the things that started moving north didn't quite move up to Scotland. So an example of that is about 500 years ago, everybody across the UK is saying oot in a boot in tune. Mm -hmm. And then there's a change in the vowel system where people start saying out and about in town, but not quite like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> out and about in town. Mm -hmm. And then that change from out to out starts spreading from London up, 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 further up, further up, into um, even into Northumberland. But even there in Northumberland, they're still saying tune. Mm -hmm. And once it gets the further away, it gets the higher up it has to go, it stops traveling, it slows down. Mm -hmm. So this is why in Scotland, we are doing what people were doing 500 years ago by saying out and doon and tune. Uh, so lots of the shared things across Scots are what we call relic features mm -hmm. from the older versions of Old English, really. So we were a bit more thrown. We just stuck to, <laughs> we, we liked the way we spoke. I'm changing. I'm nady in it. <laughs> no, I've learned that now and I'm biding with it and that's fine. Exactly. And now to our final journey. Sooth, 
to the dialect that Jenny's Doric Da couldn't understand. Welcome to Glasgow. According to the census, only about a quarter of Glaswegians claim they ken Scots. Glasgow patter hasn't aye been considered attractive or comprehensible. Hello! Yes! Yes, hello! Yes, this is Glasgow Air Traffic Control. Are you in distress? Fast and packed with local yes. words. Uh, it's been parodied from Montrose to Manhattan. No, all right. There's a wee thing about the size of an Oreo cookie, right? I thought it was a Keebler. What's the dude that coming in it? <laughs> Keebler, say again! <laughs> Mate, the brown dude that looks like an Oreo cookie. <laughs> What's it coming in it? I'm so sorry, your accent is very thick. Is it possible to not have it over? <laughs> It's funny coming down here because I really didn't feel any connection to it at all. But this is the Broomy Law, and that's where a huge chunk of my family arrive as uh, Irish migrants. My great, great granny and granda both arrived here. And I'm absolutely no expert in Glasgow Scots and certainly no in the lived experience of Glasgow Scots. So what we're going to do is we're going to meet up with a couple of the folk that are right at the heart of pitting Scots back on Glasgow's media agenda. Did you know what she did her? Did you know? No, I didn't, did I? I don't know, do you? Well, I didn't. Shit. Oh, aye. When does your face go into a house? At A-time, you could only be on the telly speaking Glaswegian if you're acting Billy Big Balls the hard man. Yeah. I'll soften her up lovely. Or being a lovable alcoholic. I have knickers <laughs> over. And I've got <laughs> That's changed. Fowker knew proud to speak the tongue of our largest city. Folk like writer Chris McQueer. Wonks! Muscles! Candy apples! Mate, what are Wilks? Oh, you like them, wee man? Nice and salty. Ah, my, my dad likes Wilks. He says they're nice or not. I give the cunt a pound and he haunts me this wee bag of the things. So the kind of success of your own work seems to be part of a, a kind of an increased confidence around Glaswegians about the way they speak. Is that is that accurate? Are you seeing that? Uh, I'd like, aye, I think so, man, aye. Um, I think I do a lot of kind of go to a lot of spoken word nights and talk, kind of mix with a lot of poets and other writers, and I think people are a lot more comfortable with how they talk and the fact that they are bilingual, that they have, that they are. Scots speakers. Anyway, take me try one of these bastards. It really doesn't look too appealing, but I eat it anyway, and fuck me, that is a taste sensation. My dad finds an arm needle for somewhere in the kitchen, and the two is just power <laughs> through the bag where we watch the scores come in on sports scene. I'd like to think it's because it's in Scots, it's made it quite accessible. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people say to me, like, it's the first book I've read since I left school, which is a really nice feeling, and mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of that is down to how it's written and the fact it's in Scots. Right. I wake up during the night, check the time on my alarm clock. It's two in the morning. My belly's killing me and my mouth's watering like fuck. The sit's coming out soon and I'm wondering if I can make it to the toilet in time or no. I get the pan lid open just in time as another wave comes. It, it hits the water with some force, man. I even get a wee bit of splash back. It's, it's rotten, it's pure fishy smelling. Just as I'm starting to drift off, I hear my dad getting out of bed and boking like fuck. There's like a couple of Amazon reviews in my books. There was like a woman gave it like one star and she was like, ah, it's not for me, but the Neds will love it. You know what I mean? It's like that, that kind of class thing there again, that seeing, equating the Scots language with being like lower class. It's almost as if they're saying like you're not a real writer because you're working class almost. And it it kind of gets to me a bit. Kinda, I'd, I'd just like to be known as a writer. Just to do, all these wee subcategories that I seem to fill in. I got up to warn my dad about the puddle of sick at the top of the stair. As I open my room door, he flies past me. Dad, be careful, I was... Bang, bang, bang. Too late. My dad slips in my sick and goes head over heels right down the stair, cracks his nut off the skirting board at the bottom, landing me a splash in another puddle of vomit.
something you've been doing that's dead interesting has been tacking your kind of personal revelations into schools. That was after the first book came out, a kind of couple of schools got in touch and said, you know, maybe your stories aren't quite appropriate for the ones, but but your kind of story is quite relevant to them and maybe you could maybe teach them a thing or two about, about writing. Right. And um, for a couple of them, maybe struggling with it, like, what are you struggling with? Describe it to me in Scots, the way they, way they talk naturally. Right. And I'd be like, right, just write it like that. Uh, what do you mean? Like, you could write it in your language, Scots. What do you mean, language? That's not my language. <laughs> yeah, it's like, how do you text your pals? Like, the way you're talking to me now, just, just write that down. <laughs> and that blew their mind. <laughs> like, I can do that, like... When the ambulance came, the paramedic asked me what happened. I said, I think it was food poisoning for some dodgy wilks. And if I ever see the guy that showed me them again, I'm going to kick his head in for making me sick and basically killing my da. Can't believe it was a bag of wilks that killed my da in the end and know the 40 fags a day. Poor guy. What a way to go. One of the things we've seen since the start of this programme is that for a language to be maintained and for dialects to thrive, you need a space that you can speak them. So in the old days, that'd be the shipyards, factories in the Kirk. But as these communities have been shutting down, new spaces have been opening up. Nowadays, if you wanted to partake in a conversation in a Scots dialect, all you hit a day is log in with one of these. Scottish social media is absolute hoochin we folk hammering out chats in their ain Scots voice. Ain of the most prominent is Glasgow's ain Janie Godley. There isn't a man in this room would say no. He'll blow you up a rolling sausage and a shark week. <laughs> in fact, if you tell every man here I'm going to touch your boby, rolling square sausage like you watch Jaws, he'll be like, I'm going to tile your bathroom, bitch. <laughs> the fact that I can use language in my comedy and not have to keep tempering it to just an English ear is really important to me. I get people that write to me on Twitter and Facebook and say, I really love your videos, but I don't understand what she's saying. Could you subtitle it? And I'm like, no. If you can learn Shakespeare, if you can learn Burns, then you can listen to my videos. And if you don't like what I'm saying, scroll on. Right, so it's that, see, that's awfully confident and it is, it's both a Marky Rain character, but it's also a Marky what feels like changing days. Do you feel that, kind of, especially Glasgow Scots, is Mayor Gallus now? I think the working classes are just owning it more now and they're not scared to admit they talk a bit slang. I think that's interesting. You see on wee boards outside pubs, they, they will do slang slogans, like, get your pie and peas here and spell all. People are enjoying it. It's not just a novelty. People are actually adopting mm. it as part of marketing as well. I'm seeing that about Glasgow, there's a lot of kind of uh, Scots phrases about that are yeah. being used basically to punt stuff. Yeah. Well, it took me a long time to embrace it again. When Ashley was wee, I wouldn't let her say windy or hairbrush. I would say it's hairbrush, not hairbrush. I tried to not let her speak slang because I thought back in the 80s that that would impede her as an, a young adult walking yeah. about going, I've got a hairbrush near the windy. No, we embrace it totally and like, you know what, fuck it, this is how I speak. This is it's ingrained in me. Stop trying to make me turn into a woman called Sophie for Essex, because it's not who I am. Huh? And I've used these words and phrases on, like, I did have I get news for you, and I used the phrase, your tease out, and they had to have explained, and they let me explain it, and the audience understood it and laughed. Mm -hmm. So there is a space for us to be able to use it as our identity, but also spread it through the world and say, ask me what it means and I'll tell you. I'll tell you what Glake it means. Right. I'll tell you what it means if you ask me. Stravagan about Scotland, me and ah the folk giving their dialects a boost, I'm more convinced than ever that Scots is here in a real renaissance. But the energy at grassroots hasn't they seen reflection in legislation. So how, after more than a decade in poor, have the SNP done so little for this national tongue? Are they maybe feared it'd lose them votes? It's quite surprising, it doesn't it feel like a radical movement to get Scottish independence? It feels more like a sort of a coming together of pals to hey, a wee fly cup and a blether.
Can I ask all those in favour of the amendment to the resolution? Thank you, conference. Cards Item down. 9 on the agenda at the conference is a motion to start work on a Scots language board, following on for a similar Gaelic initiative. The man behind the motion is young Jack Capner. This isn't about the abstract concept of the Scots language. A language only exists insofar as real people speak it. So when you marginalise Scots, what you're actually doing is marginalising its speakers. So geese your hon and he's not for Bonnie Brookett lead for to empower our folk and big a better country. Support the motion. Thank you. When you hear it yourself, I think he's preaching to the converted here already. He's waving his right hand. Thank you very much, Jack. So, delegates, there are no cards in um, against this resolution. So, can I ask, is the resolution passed by acclaim? Oh, there you hear. Thank you, conference. So we move now to a success, number 10, but in that shouldn't be tamed as a final victory. The warm words of the motion didn't compel the SNP to act. But for me, it is a move in the right direction. So Jack, the motion passed. Hi, I'm a you on the moon with happiness. <laughs> it's Fabby. Can you use that momentum to bring mere pressure to bear on the Aye, leadership? Definitely. I think where the our vice campaign that I've set up, a civic society a campaign and platform, we can really get the help here involved, get other folk for civic society. I mean, I had mathematical academic come up to me afterwards saying he'd like to get involved. Um, it's something that a lot of folk have an emotional attachment to because it's either their mother tongue or it's their family's mother tongues. Mm -hmm. And so they really, really, I think, if we jump on the party for backtracking on it, if they do, um, then we can cause a lot of outrage basically. May lead stand still. Modern Scots will keep changing, kicking out new words and phrases. And as we ring in the new, we hit a mind and no cowpow or the old. The language of our ancestors. In the end, it's all up to us. The fate of Scots is in our hands. We have to shack off the last of that cultural cringe that we hear in language. You wouldn't be feared to learn new English words, so didn't be feared to learn new Scots scenes or reclaimings you may be having used since you're a bairn. We have to use it confidently in work, at home, in the street and in art. But most importantly, we have to pass it on. So mothers, fathers, grandparents, abdi, make sure and teach it to your bairns.